This program contains coarse language, violence and distressing images. Shit, those are so many people. Let's go! Jesus It's mid-afternoon on Insurrection Day, and the mob has found its way to the entrance of the speaker's lobby. Let me do, I got a knife. I got a, I got a knife. Behind the locked doors and makeshift barricades is the inner sanctum of US politics, hung with the portraits of past lawmakers. Further down the corridor are doors to the House chamber, where congressmen and women are trapped. the all-too-familiar American tableau. Ashley Babbitt, the dying woman, is a veteran of the Afghan and Iraq wars. She will soon become a martyr for the extremists in the Trump movement. Like so many of these people, she was inspired to come here by her beloved president. victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats, which is what they're doing. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Oh, this is 2021, y'all. This is insanity. Holy shit. Before January 6, the desecration of America's Cathedral of Democracy was unimaginable. The idea that the president himself could incite such an act was unthinkable. Welcome to Four Corners from Washington, D.C., where the capital is locked down in the biggest security operation since the terror attacks of 2001. Such is the level of fear that in recent weeks, serious people here have been using the dread phrase, civil war. If there's one thing that President Trump demonstrated in his final terrifying days in office, it's that these divided states remain vulnerable to an unscrupulous demagogue. Tonight, how a defeated, disgraced, and now twice impeached president brought US democracy to the brink of destruction. <laughs> they came on planes. and on buses packing up their flags and banners and driving through the night in their tens of thousands and on trains gathering en route to record the moment. You guys know who you are and this is who showed up. USA! 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 Impassioned, resentful and easily roused these self-described patriots had been called here by their president in multiple tweets, beginning on December 19 with his invocation, be there, we'll be wild. 
None of us signed up for insurrection. We signed up for lower taxes and deregulation and, and fewer involvements overseas. And I don't think any of us ever, ever, ever in our wildest dreams expected what we were working on would result in, um, in what happened on January 6th. So I started out at the Ellipse. The crowd was big. And through all these conversations I've seen, no one talks about COVID. So that crowd was completely maskless almost. When I arrived, there were already many thousands of people there, um, people carrying Trump flags, having signs. Um, I noticed a couple of Confederate flags. Remembering my sort of early civics history classes, I felt like it was 30s Weimar Germany. The chanting, like they were worshiping an idol. And there isn't anything they weren't willing to do. People might be shocked and think I'm sensationalizing, but it's like people could never have imagined in the late 20s and early 30s what was gonna come in 1939, you know? And I think that that's what we're seeing the rise of, this subversion of democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome America's mayor, Rudy Giuliani. Trump allies supplied the violent rhetoric ahead of the president's speech. If they ran such a clean election, they'd have you come in and look at the paper ballots. Who hides evidence? Criminals hide evidence, not honest people. And if we're wrong, we will be made fools of. But if we're right, a lot of them will go to jail. So let's have trial by combat. Thank you so much for being here today to help save America. Alabama Congressman Mo Brooks, an ardent Trump loyalist, was the most inflammatory. Today is the day American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. Are you willing to do what it takes to fight for America? Louder, will you fight for America? All the while, the first family watched backstage. There's something outlandish, clownish, and downright mad about Don Jr.'s selfie video. I think we're uh, T minus a couple of seconds here, guys. So uh, check it out, tune in, we did a live stream it. There's dad, silent in the background, eyes pinned to the monitor, showing the swelling crowd he's about to send into the abyss. An actual fighter, one of the few, a real fighter. Thank you, Mark. Give her the name. Yes, have the courage to do the right thing. Fight. Thank you, guys. Just really appreciate all the love and support. It's pretty amazing. Give her the name. Time for a last dance before the conflagration. Hundreds of thousands of people here, and I just want them to be recognized by the fake news media. Turn your cameras, please, and show what's really happening out here, because these people are not going to take it any longer. They're not going to take it any longer. As he'd been doing since election night, Trump railed for most of his speech about the baseless conspiracy of fraudsters who stole away his second term. And something's wrong here, something's really wrong, can't have happened, and we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Even as Trump's fighting words echoed down the mall, in both houses of Congress, a large number of Republicans were preparing to vote against the certification of Joe Biden's election win. Some, out of fear of retribution, if they didn't do the president's bidding. There were folks who were afraid for their families, that the Capitol Hill police made it clear that they were not in a position to protect their families. 
or their families stay home, as did mine in South Carolina when I was working in Washington, D.C., and the Capitol Hill police doesn't have the ability to protect 535 families all around the country. So I think some of them may have actually just been afraid um, for their own safety. In the Senate, Republican leader Mitch McConnell took to his feet to plead with his colleagues. We're debating a step that has never been taken in American history. Whether Congress should overrule the voters and overturn a presidential election. I've served 36 years in the Senate. This will be the most important vote I've ever cast. This election were overturned by mere allegations from the losing side, our democracy would enter a death spiral. We'd never see the whole nation accept an election again. Every four years would be a scramble for power at any cost. That death spiral was only avoided when Vice President Pence resisted Trump's pressure and finally declared he had no constitutional power to overturn the election. Pursuant to the Constitution and the laws of the United States. Here's what I take away on death spiral. The Constitution held. Mike Pence is a hero. Mike Pence is an absolute American hero. If he was as crazy as Rudy Giuliani or some of the other people advising the president, we could be in a real real tough situation right now with an unclear transfer of authority, unclear as to who's running the government, unclear who the army uh, responds to. And we want to be so nice. We From his bully so pulpit in the ellipse, Trump continued to pressure his vice president. And we're going to have to fight much harder. And Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us. And if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country because you're sworn to uphold our Constitution. Now it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. And after this, we're going to walk down and I'll be there with you. Because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. Before the president finished speaking, members of a gang notorious for political violence had gathered close to the Capitol. Proud boys. The best organization in the world. And what is that? Proud boys. Hell yeah. All right, guys, you want to see all the proud boys that are here today? Here we go. Everybody cover up. Montana. What's up? Six. The largest visible group were the proud boys. Joe Biggs, the senior Proud Boy in D.C. that day, had a clear organizing role. He moved his troops to the west side of the Capitol. Let's go! Fuck this shit! You back the fuck off! You back off! At 12.52 p.m., while Trump was still speaking, this group of Proud Boys led a violent assault on a thinly manned barricade. The police were soon overwhelmed. An organized gang had orchestrated the first breach in the Capitol's defenses. Let's go! Rioters streamed towards the West Side Capitol steps. Forward! And the next line of police barricades. We're not here for you! We're here for America! Yes. These aren't just a bunch of disorganized people who are quickly labeled by some who are stupid, who are dumb, who are insane. These are highly organized, motivated zealots. USA! 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 Their belief is that the current president is won the election and that they have they are patriots by doing what they're doing. How you doing man? It was this group that Trump seemed to signal approval of in the first presidential debate last year. Are you willing tonight 
to condemn white supremacists and militia groups. Sure, Are you I'm prepared to, to do specifically that, do it? Well, I, go would ahead, say, I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right so wing. So what are you what are you, you look, what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists ahead, and right like me to condemn? White Proud supremacists boys. and right Proud Proud boys. Boys. Stand back and stand by. Did he just tell basically a Western male chauvinist club that's pseudo gang-like with ties to white supremacy and at times violent? Did he just tell them to stand by as in like be the re on the ready for potential violence that may need to happen in the post-election period? Where they were, say, a year ago, maybe more a local law enforcement concern uh, if they decided to show up in a group and uh, try to counter somebody else's uh, protest. Um, word as now they've kind of uh, grown and morphed into something that uh, it truly is a national security problem. Enrique Tarrio is the chairman of the Proud Boys and an ardent admirer of Donald Trump. Let's just go back to 2020. So it had been a pretty fierce year. The campaign was fierce. We get up to the presidential debates. Mm -hmm. That's where President Trump made his first sort of clear statement about the Proud Boys. What did you take stand back and stand by to mean? The president, when he said stand back, um, was like, hey, let's, let's take a chill pill, right? Let's, let's, let's relax. And, and we did. The more controversial portion of what he said was stand by. And it was pretty simple to me. And it was stand by me. And we have stood by the president. We've stood by the president since day one. Wasn't it a signal for you to be ready to act on his behalf? I didn't take it that way. And I think most of my guys didn't take it that way. It's kind of our, our go-to saying now. Fuck Antifa! Fuck Antifa! Fuck Antifa! Fuck Antifa! On January 6th, the Proud Boys were without their leader. <laughs> Tario had been arrested two days earlier and expelled from Washington over his role in a rally in December when he stripped a Black Lives Matter banner from a church and burnt it in the street. I don't care if it's inflammatory. I believe it's a Marxist movement. I'm not gonna apologize for it. I did something that I felt was right. And if another banner sits on the floor, I'll burn it again. The FBI is now trying to determine if he directed the actions of the Proud Boys on January 6th from a remote location. I was about an hour and a half away. Um, and, uh, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not too worried about it. There's a saying that a federal prosecutor can prosecute a ham sandwich, right, if they wanted to. Um, but I think they're gonna have a very, very hard time with me. Um, I got, uh, I got full faith in it. Under orders from Tario, the Proud Boy contingents that day didn't wear their characteristic uniforms. There's a reason why we didn't dress in our typical black and yellow, because we were tired of like trying to walk down the street and people asking us to take pictures with them. When and you posted like that. about not wearing your uniform, you said it was so that you wouldn't be visible, you wouldn't be identifiable. No, I said that we're going to go incognito, mm. so people won't come take pictures of us. I have to stop you. You cannot be making the case that you went incognito because you were tired of being stopped yeah, and I could having make your the photos case. taken. I could make that case. Having broken through the barricades with his men, proud boy Joe Biggs is seen running up the Capitol steps, almost indistinguishable from other rioters. Let's just talk about Joseph Biggs. What is his relationship to you? Uh, one of my best friends. Um, the FBI alleges that he was part of the, of commanding the Proud Boys that day. Is that correct? Was he there in your place? Um, up until he was outside, uh, we did have, there was a group of leadership. He was part of that leadership. Over a long period of time in the lead up, you've got Proud Boys posting pictures of themselves with baseball bats. You've got angry language. You've mm. got aggressive language. You've got people talking about hurting the police, killing people. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Joe Biggs here, and I just got my new bat in from Primal Customs. It's pretty fucking epic. It is a Trump bastard bat. Look at this thing. 
when Biggs posts a picture of himself some months earlier with a spiked baseball bat, what's that for? I think he's showing off this really cool bat that he has that was handmade. You know when Biggs posts a picture of himself with a weapon that there is a message that goes with that and everybody understands what that message is. Mm. What message did he post with that? The image is the message. It's a violent image. A, a, yeah, if, if a weapon is violent, again, I, I, I don't know the culture in Australia. Um, I know that you guys have uh, heavy restrictions on guns and stuff like that, and I don't expect you to understand that. Many Proud Boys, along with other organized groups, were in the front lines of the mob, attacking police barricades on the Western Steps. The cops are getting sprayed. There's a fucking fight right here. Fuck. Rubber bullets everywhere. Minor YouTube celebrity Tyler Baggins filmed the melee. Ah, oh, that one got me right in the fucking face. That one broke my fucking glasses. Holy fuck. Look at that. Fucking knocked the lens right out of my glasses. Holy fuck. They would get pepper sprayed and sort of fall back. And then, you know, someone would say, we need more people on the line, come up. And it was just like, it occurred to me they were using the language of war. Let's get some more people behind us first. How do you throw yourself Oh, right with a fucking four by four post right to the head. I need more water. I need more water. It's a motherfucking revolution. Let's take this shit. It was like this quick moving set of dominoes that were falling. It was like a medieval siege. That cop's getting agitated. They're starting to fight with him. Hell yeah, get on the ground! I can't call them protesters anymore, actually. You fucking you This is a violent, angry mob pushing up the steps, knocking the police over with the shields, moving up to the upper level of the Capitol. Guys, take a look at this. So we're up here on a scaffolding outside of the... United States Capitol. This is insanity. I can't believe this is reality. We accomplished this shit. We did this shit together. Fuck that. This is fucking history. Hell yeah. Whoa, what the fuck? They broke through. It's on. The cops are beating the fuck out of that guy. Good luck, punk. From high in the temporary scaffolding erected for Joe Biden's inauguration, Tyler Baggins captures the moment the crowd broke through at the Capitol's west entrance. It's over! You better run, cops! You better fucking run! See how fast the cops turn around once they fucking saw the numbers game. It was a numbers game. Crowds began pouring up the stairs, scaling walls like an invading army, led at many points by trained far-right militias with body armor and weapons. Baseball bats, converted pieces of wood, like two by fours that were turned into like bats. I saw hammers, metal expandable batons. Uh, a lot of people were openly carrying some form of a pepper spray or bear spray mace. And they had gas masks, so the tear gas was useless. They had body armor on, they had helmets. They had radios, they had military gear. And just the manner in which they moved, not only individually, but in groups. A lot of these people had some form of a military training. There was a strategy to all this. This was a planned attack. There is a movement of how they have their hands on each other's backs and move together, and how they attack the doors and push the doors down. I'd never seen this level of organization, actually. Elizabeth Newman was a senior official in Homeland Security, appointed by President Trump. She quit last year because of the administration's failure to confront right-wing extremism. It is apparent that the FBI had information a few days before the attack that indicated the types of things that, I have to say, if it, if it were a uh, coming from an Islamist terrorism perspective, um, they would have treated as a specific 
credible threat because of the level of detail of the of the the information that they had been able to glean from people talking online. It included things like layout of the Capitol, uh, entry points, um, how to get uh, to the individuals that that they might want to be uh, uh, getting in front of. It really is mind-boggling that the FBI had this information. Reportedly, they shared it. It is not clear to me with whom they shared. None of the normal protocols that you usually do in uh, terrorist threats like this were followed, either by the FBI or my former organization, the Department of Homeland Security. The way that they were moving through the crowds, the way that they equipped themselves, the fact that there was IEDs and pipe bombs that were laid in strategic places, the ability to move through the, through the place, which means they had studied it. Congressman Ruben Gallego, a former Marine, also recognized signs of military strategy. They entered uh, through, you know, very uh, isolated areas that were not secure. Uh, they knew to, to scale certain parts of the walls to get them into even smaller, uh, even uh, get them into the, the house that were normally uh, unprotected and very hard to reach. Caught on camera with a riot shield is another senior Proud Boy. Here, the same man, Dominic Pozzola, is seen smashing a window into the Capitol and directing others through the opening. It's believed to be the first breach of the building itself. Soon afterwards, his comrade Joe Biggs follows him inside. Proud boy Pozzola in the corridor. What he did and said inside the Capitol is now the subject of FBI charges. The FBI says it has a witness who claims that he and others stated they intended to kill mm. Nancy Pelosi and Vice President Mike Pence. Yeah. Did you send members of the Proud Boys into the Capitol to lynch members of the government? No, absolutely not, ever. In my opinion, there's nothing scarier than a white mob, especially in the United States. And um, it, it, it did not surprise me that once they got in, that the momentum just started going. With the momentum of like a whole mob behind them, it's very, very dangerous. And they would have. I think they would have, had they gotten a hold of members of Congress, they, they probably would have tried to kill those. There was definitely, you know, in a mob mentality, like, I think if they'd got to somebody, if they'd got to Nancy Pelosi, I think they'd have probably killed her. The mob rampaged through the corridors, searching for the politicians they'd branded traitors. Even as Capitol security collapsed, House Republicans were on their feet in a last-ditch effort to overturn Biden's victory. Over 400,000 mail-in ballots were altered, switched from President Trump to Vice President Biden, or completely erased from President Trump's totals. I was preparing my notes and talking to other members of Congress from Arizona because we were supposed to defend the Arizona electoral count. And we started hearing some commotion outside the chambers. Uh, Madam, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, can I have order in the chamber? The House will be in order. In the confusion, the Secret Service began evacuations of senior lawmakers. The House will be in order. OK. Nancy Pelosi had just been whisked away, which is another indication that things were about to go bad. The sound was a combination of chaos from the people on the floor and then just, you know, loud shouting and, like, pounding at doors all around us. Uh, and it was, um, it was wild. <laughs> At this point, we are told to put on this gas mask. People are not doing it either correctly or they're freaking out and they're hyperventilating. So I got on a desk and started shouting instructions about what to do with the gas mask, about staying calm, and explain how to open it up. Security drew guns. You know, if I had one, I would have felt a little better, but there was very little security actually in the chamber. 
We respect the law. We were good people. The government did this to us. We were normal, good, law-abiding citizens, and you guys did this to us. We want our country back. We are protesting for our freedom right now. That's the difference. This is our country. This is our house. That's it. This is our house. This is our country. This is our country. It's not going to fucking end well. No, no, it's not. Like most of the nation and much of the world, Trump's former chief of staff was watching the insurrection live. He turned to Twitter, having failed to get through to the president by phone. I did take that very unusual step for me, especially of tweeting at the president, knowing that he would see it. After witnessing the desecration of a place that means so much to you, what did you expect the president to do? To go on TV and say, no, 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 stop, now. This is not, I did not want this. Do not, you are not helping me. You are not patriots. This is not right. You need to stop right now and leave the building. And the fact that he didn't, what does that tell you? Uh, bothered me a great deal. That's why I resigned. Um, and it will color my opinion of the president forever. I was a national campaign co-chair for Donald Trump. I ran Catholics for, uh, for Trump in the campaign. I worked for him for four years in, I think, three or four different positions. The president did not have a stronger supporter than I did before January 6th. As insurgents raged through the Capitol, at 2.24 p.m., President Trump tweeted, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done. USA demands the truth. At the north entrance, I heard the crowds begin to shout, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence. And, you know, it was just mind-blowing to me. These were insurrectionists calling for the death of the vice president of the United States. As a lifelong Republican, what do you think about the way he singled out Mike Pence? Do you reproach him for that? Yes. Why? Unforgivable. Just not Mike Pence is one of the most decent, honest, loyal people you are ever going to meet in your entire life. Um, and I understand the president did not ever call him during the riot to check on his well-being. And that is inexcusable. Soon after the first insurrectionist broke into the building, Officer Eugene Goodman confronted the angry mob on his own. He called for assistance as he ran up several flights, leading them away from the Senate chamber. It was a matter of seconds and a matter of feet. If the police officer had not led the protesters to the left as they came up the stairs, and instead they had gone right, they would have come to one of the main doors into the Senate just feet from Pence's ceremonial office where he was taken to. And if they had tried to get into either the Senate chamber there or Pence's office at that moment, it would have been a bloodbath. Let me do, I got a knife, I got a, I got a knife. On the House side, Ruben Gallego and his fellow lawmakers were finally evacuated in the clear sight of rioters trying to break into the Speaker's lobby. As I look left, I saw the protesters at the door, pounding the door, and two security personnel there. That basically was it between us and this rabid crowd. And what was the physical distance between where you were and where they were? I'd say maybe 30, 30 feet at this point. I was so close I could take a picture. I did take a picture, actually. Senators, their staff and journalists, were moved through tunnels to secure locations in the basement. At one point, I heard a Capitol Police officer tell two other younger police officers to stand in this one spot, uh, and if they were approached, that they were supposed to shoot. I could actually hear the, the you know, rioters uh, one hallway over as they were moving, I think, towards, up towards the chamber we were just in. FBI investigators claimed that intelligence on the location of the politicians hidden in secret basement rooms was being sent on Facebook to a militiaman inside the Capitol. All members are in the tunnels under Capitol, said one message. Seal them in. Turn on gas. We have a good group. We got about 30, 40 of us. 
We're sticking together and sticking to the plan. Other trained militia members were using the walkie-talkie app Zello for real-time communications inside the capital. We are in the mezzanine. We are in the main dome right now. We are rocking it. They're throwing grenades. They're freaking shooting people with paintballs, but we're in here. Get it, Jess. Do your... This is what we've lived up for. Everything we've trained for. Ashley Babbitt, another war veteran and a QAnon fanatic, would pay with her life for her last mission to reverse Trump's election defeat. There's a gun! 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 She knew exactly what was happening. She broke through. She was warned. And it's unfortunate, but um, I hope that police officer knows that he should have no regrets. Secure in the White House, Donald Trump watched for hours as the worst crisis of his presidency unfolded on live TV. That's where the president lost me, was in his actions during the riot. He had a chance on the biggest stage at the most important time in my lifetime, which is what it was to be presidential, and I think he failed in that. His legacy is now going to be that he was somehow tied. Was it incitement to riot? I don't know, but he was not blameless in what happened on January 6th, and that, I think, is gonna be his legacy, and that's what makes us all very, very disappointed. As reinforced police began to expel insurgents from the Capitol in increasingly violent clashes, the White House released the president's videoed message to the rioters. I know your pain, I know you're hurt. We had an election that was stolen from us. It was a landslide election, and everyone knows it, especially the other side. But you have to go home now. We have to have peace. We have to have law and order. We have to respect our great people in law and order. So go home. We love you. You're very special. I know how you feel. But go home and go home in peace. And to go on TV afterwards, late in the afternoon, um, and say that, you know, go home, we love you. No, we don't. No, we don't love people who break glass, uh, storm into the Capitol building for the purpose of disrupting the constitutional transfer of power. We don't love people who take actions that lead to the death uh, of innocent people, of law enforcement. Those are not the people we love. Six of Enrique Tarrio's Proud Boys, including two key lieutenants, have already been indicted for their actions on January 6. As federal investigators hone in on the group, there have been calls for stringent new laws to combat domestic terrorism. It's inauguration day in Washington, and there's so many troops and police on the ground, so many roadblocks, that Proud Boys and other extremists have vowed to stay away. It remains tense. The memories of January 6 are still raw. We've learned again that democracy is precious. Democracy is fragile. And at this hour, my friends, democracy has prevailed. So now, on this hallowed ground where just a few days ago, violence sought to shake the Capitol's very foundation, we come together as one nation, under God, indivisible, to carry out the peaceful transfer of power. 
the inauguration is taking place on the other side of town and it feels like a very long way from where we are here in Anacostia where the locals already suffering before the virus really understand the impacts of racism on their daily lives. Black Lives Matter. <laughs> no, Overcrowded prisons. Inhumane conditions. Um, so the food will be ready in like 30 minutes. Okay. Full of my people. Excuse me, excuse me. See, that's what I'm saying about people that don't have nothing on their mind, nowhere to go. How y'all doing today? Today's a night that Lord had given. <laughs> Anacostia is the poorest neighborhood in the capital. Local black activist Ariana Evans comes here to hand out free clothes and food to people who have little of both. No one here seems too interested in the big event taking place just over the river. Joe Biden's being inaugurated, but you're not watching. Why not? I'm not watching because Joe Biden doesn't really represent me or my generation or any of the values that I hold as a human being. Is it still a relief to you that Donald Trump is going? Absolutely. It's my birthday. It's the best birthday gift I've ever gotten. The events of January 6 only served to increase Ariana's cynicism. I saw a bunch of entitled white people getting what they want in this country, That's as they always have. They've always been treated that way, which is the reason why they felt comfortable enough to storm the Capitol in the first place. They did this because they knew they could. When they walked through the corridors, when they walked through the velvet ropes, all organized like it was a school trip, this is why they believe it's their country. All I saw when I saw that smug white man sitting in that chair with his feet kicked up on the speaker's desk was like, this is what white privilege looks like. What would have happened if you and your fellow protesters had tried to do what they did? We would have been dead on the grass. We wouldn't have made it to the stairs. We wouldn't have made it to the white marble because they wouldn't have wanted to spray our blood off of that. We would have been dead in the grass. Under the marble eyes of the president who presided over America's last civil war, soldiers barracked in the capital record their visit here with photographs. Thousands of them will remain throughout Donald Trump's upcoming Senate trial. The route from the ellipse to the capital so recently full of that angry chanting mob is quiet again now, restored to the locals and to sightseers. The echoes of that whipped up rage are gone now, but they'll be heard again as evidence in Trump's Senate trial. The Capitol itself has been swept clean, but it remains the corrupted citadel of a democracy that proved to be fragile and vulnerable to a president's lies. But the concern I have from a security perspective is when you have 50 million people in this country that believe in this big lie, because it hasn't been thoroughly debunked enough, then some small percentage, maybe it's only 1%, but 1% is 500,000 people. 500,000 people willing to commit acts of violence that while we have really great security services in this country, it's, it's very difficult to take on a 500,000 uh, violent mob, if you will. There is a population of this country that has gotten used to always being on top and not having to share power or wealth or anything else like that. And now they have to do that and they have to compete. And psychologically, it's breaking them. I had no idea we were this close to violence in this country. I knew we were divided. I knew that people were unhappy on both sides. I had no idea that we were this close to breaking that democracy as we came on January 6th. I think it's a lesson for us 
Um, and I think it's a lesson for other Western-style democracies that things are not necessarily as safe and stable as they may appear. What lessons will America learn from this deep rupture to its soul? In due course, there'll be an investigation into the insurrection, its causes, the intelligence and policing failures. But for now, the Senate will be transformed into a court to try the impeached president. For so long, the Republicans bent so much to one man's will that many began calling it the Trump party. Now it seems likely the senators will vote to acquit the disgraced president allowing him to claim a final victory. That will pose a huge challenge for President Biden and his promise to unite the country.